Okay, let, let's start now. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm Patrick Salmon, and I'm the Chief Historian at the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the, the first of our new series of seminars, Official History, Past, Present and Future. It's something we've been wanting to do a long time, actually, well before the pandemic, we started talking about it. Um, and also a long time before we realized the potential of what we all now take for granted, which of course is the online seminar. And this has given us the opportunity, uh, first of all, to reach a much wider audience than we'd ever imagined. And also to throw the seminars open to people we'd never heard of on subjects we never thought, we never even thought of. So, you know, we're extremely grateful for that new world that's opened up. Um, and of course, it's also the opportunity to bring together official historians, people like me and some of the others you, you, who are speaking today, um, people, in other words, who work for government or for other uh, public bodies, or have recently done so, uh, with unofficial historians of, of, of every kind, academic and otherwise. And either implicitly or, or implicitly, I think we'll be asking ourselves and inviting you to ask questions over the next few months. Um, questions like, for instance, simple ones, why do governments and other public bodies commission official histories um, as a learning exercise, perhaps, for their own officials, uh, to make available material that wouldn't other by, otherwise be released, or perhaps to control the narrative in some way? Uh, then secondly, can we trust official historians if they're the only ones allowed to see the documents? Thirdly, can official historians be sure they've seen all the relevant documents. Perhaps there is one, uh, as Herbert Butterfield famously claimed, there's always one secret drawer which holds the real secrets and which to and to which only government has the key. Or is that a paranoid uh, uh, sort of view? Uh, is there a danger that official historians may become institutionalized or too close to their subjects? And finally, is there still a role for official history in the era of freedom of information and public inquiries. Why do we still do this? Why do other governments in other countries still do it? Those are just the first questions that come to mind, and of course there'll be many more. Um, what I'd like to do now is briefly thank the people who made this series possible. Um, in the first instance, my colleague Richard Smith, who I think was the first person who actually had the idea, and then uh, Professor Philip Murphy and Natalia Fantetti, our partners at the Institute of Historical Research, who really provide the whole framework which made it possible. There are the usual housekeeping points, which I'll raise right at the beginning. Um, each contributor will speak for about 20 minutes, and then after that, there'll be an opportunity for asking questions and making comments. Um, we'd appreciate it if you stay mute during that time. And if you do want to make uh, comments or ask questions, please put them in the chat and we'll monitor them and raise them. Um, towards the end. And if during the during the question time you want to raise questions, just raise your hand. All the sessions are being recorded, so please be aware of that. Uh, but of course, if you miss one, you'll be able to catch up with it later. We hope that each session will last about an hour and a quarter. We may allow, allow ourselves more time if the, if the conversation uh, seems to require it. Uh, looking forward, um, you'll probably know already the series is going to be running through the spring and right through to the autumn of, of 2024 with a summer break. Um, the final seminar will be a hybrid one in person and online. I think it will probably take place at Senate House. We haven't decided that yet. Um, it'd be very great to see as many of you as possible on that occasion. The first eight sessions are, as you probably know, um, already advertised online. And if you haven't signed up for them, please do so. The next one, uh, takes place in, in three weeks' time on Wednesday the 7th of February, and it'll be on the Wartime Special Operations Executive, SOE. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speakers. Uh, Mark Seaman uh, is unfortunately ill and can't make it this evening, but his colleague Chris Baxter is here. That's, that's so is Tony Comer, the former GCHQ historian. And they'll be giving us an insight into how two important intelligence histories came into existence. Keith Jeffries, MI6, the history of the Secret Intelligence Service, and John Ferris's Behind the Enigma, the history of GCHQ. 
So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over now uh, to Chris Baxter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, very good evening to everybody watching this evening. Uh, again, my apologies that my colleague Mark Seaman uh, can't make it uh, today to be with you. Uh, he sends his apologies. Uh, he's unwell, I'm afraid. Um, but he has asked me to deliver uh, his part of, of the talk. We were going to split it into two sections and to uh, give you his observations uh, of what it was like to work on the authorised history of the Secret Intelligence Service, of course, more popularly known as MI6. Um, at the time that the history was commissioned, the decision was made in 2005, uh, Mark uh, was working in the Cabinet Office, uh, and part of his duties at that time was to help breathe some life into some of the outstanding volumes in the official history programme, especially those of the Special Operations Executive. Uh, and in three weeks' time, as Patrick has already mentioned, uh, Mark will hopefully be talking to you uh, about those. And perhaps just a word here um, to talk about the, word, the words official and authorised. Uh, so the history that I'm going to be talking about is uh, an authorised history. Uh, it was not an official history. Uh, it was not part of the Cabinet Office's official history programme. Uh, but an authorised history uh, independently commissioned by the department concerned. And of course, in this case, that was SIS. Now, Mark uh, was asked at the early stages of the SIS project to offer support and advice. And eventually he participated in the whole project from the first conversations to eventual publication. Now, some of the early discussions in, uh, uh, within SIS on what to do uh, you may be interested to uh, learn about was you know how do you go about it what's the best way of delivering uh, some of the organization's early history uh, and the early discussions uh, included perhaps uh, putting together a compendium covering the period 1909 to 1949 with chapters assigned to indiv individual historians dealing with specific topics uh, selected authors would then be given access to the relevant parts of the archive uh, another option uh, was to divide the period into two, uh, taking 1909 to 1939, and then separately 1939 to 1949, uh, with the volumes being possibly written by, by two separate authors. Uh, but in the end, as you all know, SIS senior management uh, chose to go for a single volume uh, written by, a, uh, by one author. Uh, Mark was aware that there was a selection process to ensure that the right candidate was appointed, uh, but he had little to do with it and was not privy to it. But Mark was delighted that Professor Keith Jeffrey, uh, in the latter's own words, uh, got the gig, as he used to say. Uh, he'd been a close personal friend for a very long time and, of course, was a superb historian. Uh, and I should just add now, of course, it's with great regret that uh, uh, Keith cannot be here with us. Uh, he sadly passed away uh, in 2016 and uh, went far, far too young. Um, and it's a real shame he can't be here to tell you about his experiences, but I hope you will indulge uh, myself and Mark uh, to try and give you uh, our view of what happened. Now, when Keith first uh, came to work on the project, he hadn't worked on intelligence history for a few years, but he still re retained a strong grounding in the subject and possessed a very strong understanding of the domestic and international picture of the era. But Keith had no previous British government connections. Good morning, Keith... Mesh, up to this other show. And in Thursday, Thursday we're doing um, a song from Zombie Chili. We're going to wear Zombie Chili outfits. I don't want to do that. There's someone on speaking up. Put yourselves on mute, please. Thanks. I've been trying to mute so far. Chris. You're muted, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. 
I'll, I'll just repeat the last couple of sentences just in case uh, I've been locked off. Uh, what I was saying was that Keith uh, had no previous connections to the British government uh, and could be classed as somebody who could provide an objective view of the service. Uh, warts and all, as Keith used to say. Now, Mark and Keith worked closely on the book proposal together, uh, but Mark was not part of the process by which Bloomsbury emerged as the successful applicant to publish the work. And of course, at that time, it was of the Harry Potter fame as well, so it's seen as a, a, a real coup to get Bloomsbury as the publishers. Now, in Mark's uh, view, he really saw his duties as, as what he called acting as the prisoner's friend. Uh, the project was very much countercultural for SIS, and it took a long time uh, before comments such as, we shouldn't be doing this, uh, died down. Uh, actually, quite interestingly, when draft chapters were submitted to a sensitivity review group, a few of its members even offered personal criticisms of the text, notably that it was coming across as a bit negative. Uh, Mark and others were quick to reply that su such observations did not fall within their review brief. And Mark also saw it as essential that Keith uh, should not self-censor and should write the narrative as he saw fit and then let the sensitivity reviewers do their work. As the project drew to a close, uh, the disclosure issues heightened and sadly may have taken a little bit of the gloss off the project for Keith at the end. But moreover, of course, as some of you may know, Keith had to also confront a serious illness. And now on that latter issue, everyone, including the publishers, were united in supporting a decision to delay publication in order that Keith could uh, convalesce properly and be spared the stress of chasing the original deadline. But he would not be moved and bravely kept to the original delivery dates. Now, although the process for writing and publishing a book was not perfect, but then again, what, what process is, overall, Mark considers it, it was pretty successful. And as a roundup, uh, Mark wanted to outline some of his own personal observations that I will convey to you. At the first, that there were some logistical challenges of an author whose family home was in Northern Ireland, but Keith's hard work and dedication made light of this challenge, uh, and I suspect Tony in the next talk will talk about the challenges he and his GCHQ colleagues had to contend with with, a, with an author based in Canada. Second point, while the ebb and flow of senior management ultimately did not damage the momentum of the project, the continued senior ownership would probably have solved uh, some problems uh, as we went along. Uh, partners in Whitehall were brought in early and a Whitehall cons consultation group was formed. Uh, its remit didn't really include the nitty gritty of sensitivity review, but rather served as a cross de uh, department sort of safety blanket, if you like, for the project. And it prevented any future claims of anyone saying, oh, we didn't know anything about this. So everybody was brought on early into the project. The book came in on time, uh, and this was uh, due in large measure to Keith's commitment and discipline in compiling research and writing schedules and adhering to them. Uh, for Mark, as he, is, as he has observed, working on several cabinet office official histories, uh, the contrast sometimes can be quite remarkable. Several commissioned official histories have simply failed to appear. And Mark wonders whether the disciplined team-based models for departmental histories might serve as a better template. The parameters for the project were set early on and stood the test of time. Writing about the period 1909 to 1949 was achievable and also allowed a full history to be written on the organization without some of the restrictions that were to be placed on MI5s and GCHQs. <laughs> Finally, one of Mark's final observations really is he deems it absolutely essential that future decisions to embark on official or authorized histories are based on detailed studies of earlier undertakings preferably including discussion with those who have taken part uh, in such projects. So that's the first segment there. There Mark's ob observations uh, that he, he asked me to kindly to convey to you. Uh, and now uh, my turn really to tell you about my experience uh, working on the history. Uh, again, it's a real shame that Keith can't be here 
to talk about it. Uh, before I'd worked on this project, uh, I, I knew Keith, but I'd never worked with him before. I think, but it was a testament to Keith's kindness and warm personality that enabled us to uh, form an extremely close relationship. Um, and when people ask me about my experiences on the project, I think one word always comes to mind and it was fun. And I'm gonna hopefully share a bit of a PowerPoint with you now uh, where you will see an image just to keep you all interested. Um, your start of a 10, if you like. Uh, there's me and Keith pictured in a cafe. And, and perhaps as I talk, you might want to guess where, uh, where we are situated. Uh, and I'll come back to the other slides uh, in a minute. Now, Keith, when he took up the project, uh, he had just uh, been fairly recently appointed uh, to Queen's University Belfast, and, and I joined him as a research fellow at the university, leaving my job uh, as an historian at the Foreign Office, and I've been working uh, with Patrick. But of course, most of our work would be conducted in London. The most important challenge we felt was to get the story right. Keith did have unrestricted access, as did I, to the service archive uh, for the period of the book. Uh, Keith made his own independent judgments of the sources he used uh, as an experienced academic. Now, the very nature and scope of the book forced upon Keith, of course, some tough choices. The book covered, covered four decades uh, and was split into five phases. Uh, the service's creation, uh, the First World War, the interwar period, operations in the Second World War, uh, and finally, a survey of the early Cold War period. And we felt that having a beginning, middle and end certainly gave it a, a strength of purpose. But of course, the book had a finite length uh, and it was attempting to cover all SIS operations across the globe over a 40 year period, taking into its stride two world wars. Space, of course, was going to be at a premium. But to help support Keith and myself, there were other part time researchers employed uh, and there were therefore uh, the challenges co of coordinating the team to make it its most efficient tasking, taking notes from documents, taking digital images, making photocopies from external archives, both domestic and foreign, etc. Keith, of course, could not eyeball every single file and he therefore had to rely on his team to help support him in reaching the tight deadline for publication. Now, as part of this framework, Keith made a, a very conscious decision to base the book principally on the SIS archive. And I would say, and why not? I mean, Keith called it, uh, quote, an extraordinary once in a lifetime opportunity and privilege to be appointed by SIS to write uh, its history. Now, Keith was absolutely confident addressing one of the sort of wider questions that he had utterly unrestricted access to the service archives over its first 40 years. Uh, and I can confirm this was the case for me too. Uh, nothing was denied to me uh, when I requested it. Now the archive itself uh, was quite interesting. It turned, to be, it turned out to be entirely unpredictable, sometimes patchy, sometimes exhaustive, and sometimes uh, amazingly frustrating. Uh, certainly since no one envisaged uh, that any professional history of any sort would be written, let alone one that might be published, there was no imperative to retain materials for historical reasons. So not un unnaturally, a lot of material had been lost. Uh, that said, there was a substantial enough archive to mine. Uh, the irony, and quite an interesting one as well, perhaps surprisingly, was that the archive uh, contained comparatively little actual intelligence. Uh, and during the period under our study, SIS was always primarily, of course, a collection agency responding to specific or general requests for information from customer departments. Uh, the information requested, if available, was, collect was collected and passed on to, relevant, to the relevant department. Little or no analysis was applied to the material within SIS, apart from uh, some outline indication about its reliability or otherwise the source. Once the raw material was passed to the user department, they then processed it. Intelligence assessment was the job of, of course, a particular desk in the Foreign Office, the Director of Military Intelligence, the JIC, and so on. And really we find with 
uh, you know, while the popular culture of human intelligence is littered with yarns about the master spy, I think one of the things that we found was the actual bulk of the SIS story for the period was about hundreds, if not thousands, of extraordinary agents, men and women, gathering tiny fragments of information in circumstances fraught with danger, which needed to be collected and pieced together to provide the big picture. Uh, for those of you interested, uh, Harry Ray, who uh, works for SOE, uh, really captures this, I think, quite well. He's written a book called A Schoolmaster's War. He was actually a head teacher at my old school. Uh, he's almost embarrassed about what he did for SOE in occupied France. And uh, he is always talking about the person who put him up for the night, the person who gave him the meal, the, uh, a meal. Uh, the person who looked after him, you know, all the people that get forgotten about, but all the people who put their lives uh, in danger uh, to, to help uh, those that are carrying out clandestine warfare. And I think that's something I'm always keen to sort of press uh, and portray about the history uh, of SIS and other secret services. And just some of the nitty gritty we might talk about, you know, some of the, the, the basics that the spy is doing, not the super spy or spy in Hitler's headquarters. Uh, in, these, are the spy, these are the spies and agents doing train watching, coast watching, Dave Izu reporting on fixed defences, minefields, pillboxes, etc. Uh, before D-Day. If a ship leaves port under radio silence, what do you do? We need an SIS agent in place in a mountain with a wireless set to say it's left port and get that message back. Uh, to London. So this was trying to capture the essence of, of, of what the organisation did. Now, sometimes because of the patchiness of the SIS archive, uh, the story lay outside the SIS archive, uh, and there was a need to visit foreign archives. Uh, Mark, I should say, Mark Seaman was very keen to press upon us that uh, the deficiencies of the SIS archive could be made good by tackling uh, external archives, both domestic and foreign. Uh, and while we, certainly, while we certainly tackled some, Keith visit, visited the United States and several European capitals, there may have been scope uh, to do more. But planning really played a crucial part in the successful delivery of the text to the publishers. Uh, Keith already had a, a, a chapter scheme in place before I joined him as his researcher in the summer of 2006. Uh, we decided to approach the last 10 years first, that's 1939 to 1949, as we felt that might be the hardest when it came to disclosure, best to tackle that period first, and then we went on to 1939. Uh, Chris, can I interrupt you a minute? Yes. Um, your slides aren't visible. Oh, okay, that's fine though. I, uh, did, you see the, did you see the first one of me and no. Keith? No, right, okay. Can you see them now? No, yes? No, no, you can't. No. If you can show, can you use the show contents uh, button? Um, where's the share screen? Yeah, let me try that again. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so sorry for those of you who couldn't see earlier, uh, there's just really sentimental reasons almost. There's a picture of me and Keith in a cafe uh, and uh, a little bit of a quick quiz question for you. Uh, perhaps put your answers in the comments section. Do you know where Keith and I were sat? And perhaps who was the mysterious third man taking the photograph? Uh, but it's a very famous location uh, in SIS's uh, history. Uh, and I'm leaving really the photographs uh, until the end because we've mentioned Keith's illness uh, and I certainly wish to place on record his bravery and, uh, and his uncomplaining behaviour uh, that he showed throughout really to, to get on with it. But of course, there were some consequences, uh, especially as Keith remained determined to, to meet the deadlines. Uh, and arguably, we would have liked to have spent a bit more time on collecting images uh, for the book, although in the end we managed to to, to get quite a few. Uh, and which leads me on to the sort of final part of my book, um, which is an interesting one for the commissioning of authorised official histories when you're no longer, of course, in the past, it was uh, His Majesty's Stationary Office or Routledge, 
uh, and there's a different commercial imperative if you're dealing with Bloomsbury, who want obviously to uh, make a lot of money and sell a lot of books. Uh, and what I want to share with you is that when they were coming to look at the book covers, both the back and front of the book, uh, the the first iteration of the book cover for the British version, oh, sorry, this is the American version, the immersion. So the first iteration of the book covers for the American version, which was by Penguin, was they wanted a whack a gun on the front of the cover. Of course, that sent a lot of people <laughs> into a bit of a frenzy in SIS because that was exactly the sort of image that they did not want uh, to present, but you can see why a gun looks sexy and you want to put that on the front cover of a book. Uh, but we managed to persuade them that that really was not what was wanted. Uh, and hopefully if my slide works, a camera was put on the front uh, as being you know, much more the business of what uh, a regular SIS spy was doing. And then we had the British version. Uh, and of course, this was a real problem because on the back cover of the British version, the first image that the Publishers Broomsley wanted to put a put a picture of was, I don't know if you can see it there, was Kim Philby. Again, lots of people's hair started to fall out that the first image you see on the back cover of the MI6 authorized history is a picture of a traitor. Um, so again, uh, we sort of try, but again, you can see the commercial imperative that Kim Philby is well known, and that's gonna sort of be a hook uh, to grab people's attention. But uh, uh, fortunately, we managed to persuade people that that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, and in the end, uh, we had a picture of Agent Ecclesiastic, uh, seen in the top left-hand uh, corner there. She was a, a double agent working out of wartime Lisbon at the time. And I'm just going to come out of the PowerPoint and just end on a, a couple of uh, observations. Uh, and I think the two observations I want to finish with, uh, especially this was one Keith was keen on, the, the most important aspect of the whole project for Keith was that of historical accuracy. Uh, and this was certainly not going to be sacrificed by using a racy embellished yarn uh, in a memoir just because it made uh, good reading. And finally, Keith also said this about official or authorized histories uh, and one certainly to ponder perhaps in the questions. They are, as he quite rightly stated, rarely the final definitive word on the topic. To again use his words, Keith argues Quote, we know that all history is interim and official or, or authorised histories should therefore simply be a starting point, a kind of brush clearing exercise, a part only of the jigsaw upon which others can build. Uh, I will leave it there and, and thank you very much for listening and look forward to questions uh, after Tony's talk. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for that, Chris. And also thank you for that tribute to uh, to Keith, who we, many of us knew and loved and respected. So that was really good. Thank you. Well, next, please, it's Tony. Please, please take over. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, the centenary of MI5 and SIS in 2009 wasn't GCHQ's. GCHQ was founded as the Government Code and Cipher School in 1919. The effect of on GCHQ of the publication of the authorised histories of the other two agencies was that it gave us time to think about our approach to such a publication. GCNCS was the successor of the separate units in the Admiralty and War Office, which had essentially created the first Signals Intelligence Bureau in the UK. Uh, responsible at first for the interception and reporting of enemy messages and quickly acquiring the responsibility for cryptanalysis and for the production of intelligence uh, derived in the, from the way in which the enemy communicated as much as from the content of the messages. And then from similar study of the communications of neutral countries. GCHQ has had a departmental historian on and off since 1919. The main purpose of the post was to write internal classified histories. And there were three main motives for this. First, like having a good filing system, internal histories were considered to be something good civil service departments did. And there was a strong tradition in GCHQ deriving, I imagine, from the fact that it was successively a department of the Admiralty and then the Foreign Office and on the open vote rather than the secret vote from its foundation until 1945, 
Second, in a technological organization, mapping the internal technological changes, which responded to technical changes in both telecommunications in general and in the specific communications of GCHQ's main intelligence targets was important as it helped at least potentially answer questions about strengths and weaknesses in GCHQ's intelligence production. And third, it helped inform decisions on the retention of records. Although exempted from having to release records to the PRO, GCHQ staff selected records for permanent provision, uh, for permanent retention, as though the organization were not exempt and the selection process was informed by the records used to create the internal histories. As it happens, the thresholds for preservation by GCHQ were much less stringent than those applied in other parts of government. And when in the mid 1990s, the decision was made to declassify and release records of SIGINT from 1914 to 1945, the representatives of PRO were horrified by the quantities of material that GCHQ was trying to push their way. And they deemed that much of the material that had been selected for preservation was not actually uh, records. Uh, they were simply a reflection of the way GCHQ worked. So this led to some of the material that had been kept being destroyed, but actually a much larger subset being sent on permanent loan effectively to the Bletchley Park Trust, where it's, it's available. I became GCHQ's eighth internal historian in 2009, though I'd worked closely with my predecessors since about 2001. And in the context of this series of events, the main item on the to-do list that I inherited was to provide GCHQ comments on successive instalments of Keith Jeffrey's uh, History of MI6. The process was interesting and educational because release in its broadest sense of putting into the public domain things that had hitherto been secret was not something that GCHQ prepared any of its staff for. The Second World War records release programme that ran from 94 to 2004 was thought of as a one-off and was carried out effectively by three experienced, recently retired members of staff who were given firm instructions regarding what was and wasn't still sensitive and whose instinct was basically cautious, if in doubt, retain. And though there was not a lot that was retained, it was something that was restricted to these three members of staff. Uh, I decided early on, really, that I would only comment in, on Keith's book on any areas in which uh, SIGINT interests were in play. And as MI6 only goes as far as 1949, there really was very little uh, that hadn't already been released. We had little direct input. But I learned a lot from seeing the way in which SM SIS engaged with government departments to ensure that while sensitivities were understood, that their history would nevertheless be both informative and authoritative. I also took particular note of the reaction which perhaps unfairly seemed to come particularly from academics to Christopher Andrews' repeated sourcing of information as security service archives. There seemed to be almost an insinuation that unless they could, as the Bible puts it, see in his hands the print of the nails and put their finger into the print of the nails and put their hand into the side, then the texts quoted were of limited value. It was an interesting contrast with the way that a mythology of Sigint at Bletchley Park during the Second World War had grown up and persisted despite the release of records, which demonstrated that the myths were without foundation. But separate from the effect that the publication of these two histories might have had, there were two factors that completely changed the context in which GCHQ's decision about commissioning a history of its own uh, would be taken. The first was the conscious decision uh, by GCHQ in 2009 to increase the pace of developing openness, uh, increase transparency, and a decision of making its history part of the way that GCHQ sold itself publicly. 
And then the second subsequent to that was Edward Snowden. Uh, the first added that I mentioned to GCHQ's public face by an engagement with what people who knew something about Second World War SIGINT thought the organisation actually was about. Uh, the second led pretty quickly to a, a new mythology, as inaccurate as the myth of Bletchley, which cast GCHQ as an organisation willfully determined to break the law and ride roughshod over civil liberties and privacy. It had been clear to GCHQ for a while that the transformation of communications technology would mean that GCHQ needed a new legislative framework and a better understanding of GCHQ's capabilities and how they were deployed and used would have to be part of this. Snowden merely accelerated the process and after temporary legislation in 2014, uh, a new act, the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016, came into force and provided a new framework for GCHQ operations. Even before he stepped down, uh, GCHQ's director from 2008 to 2014, Ian Lobben, was already beginning to think about GCHQ's centenary in 2019 and the possibility of an authorised history. I personally was a lot less keen uh, wouldn't a large release of post-1945 records allow more historians to write authoritatively about GCHQ? Uh, Ian's successor, Robert Hannigan, uh, was politely insistent, however, that there was going to be uh, an authorised history as part of the centenary, though perhaps to save my blushes, he pointed out that a large release would have to be accompanied by so many explanatory, explanatory notes that commissioning a history wouldn't really be that much greater a step at all. We had to define what our aim was and work out what the constraints in achieving that aim were, and we needed to select an author. We also needed to be transparent about what and what wasn't in scope for release. Our aim was an authoritative history which would show how the intelligence produced by GCNCS, GCHQ, had made a difference. From that point of view, it would be outward looking rather than internally focused. And the principal constraint was that of release. Apart from material already released, we would need to secure agreement, not only from UK departments regarding subject sensitivity, but from Five Eyes partner agencies before we could release anything that might reveal information about sources and methods which one of the five partners still deemed sensitive. The latter is a perennial problem for GCHQ historians when who are the people responsible for making the final decision to approve release. Uh, for example, the intelligence reporting from the Second World War uh, or deriving from decrypted Japanese signals was released in the late 1990s. But the cryptanalytic histories and the cryptographic memoranda about Japanese uh, encryption have still not been released. And the fact is that Japanese codes, the fact that Japanese codes were broken isn't sensitive anymore, but details of the techniques used, some of which are still applicable today, still are sensitive. In a way, that sort of decision is binary. Are the sources and methods used to intercept the material sens still sensitive? Does the fact that Japanese communications were a target for the intelligence agency, uh, does that matter? And the answer to both is no. So the decision to release the reports was pretty easy. How the intercepted material was analysed and turned into intelligence is more difficult. There are more stakeholders with a vote. And anyway, until enough materials released, a partial release can actually mislead. For example, the SIGINT relationship with US naval authorities in the Pacific theater during the Second World War was much less close and was much more fraught than the relationship with the US Navy in the North Atlantic and the European theater. To have released records relating only to one theater would have led, leaders, uh, would have led readers easily to draw wrong inferences about the other. We also imposed a major constraint on ourselves by saying that diplomatic SIGINT after 1945 
would not be in scope for the book. About 150,000 diplomatic SIGINT reports covering the period 1919 to 1945 have been released and can be used to illustrate how secret intelligence can influence or not influence the development of government policy. Uh, releasing diplomatic reporting for the, from the Cold War might produce more examples to illustrate the process, but it wouldn't change the way the process itself works, which depends now, as it always has, on the ability of GCHQ to produce intelligence on a timely way, uh, intelligence of value mainly to the Foreign Office, and the ability of ministers and officials to use the intelligence provided. Moving beyond 1945 wouldn't have enabled a different story to be told, but would have meant assessing large numbers of reports for political and technical sensitivity and taking even more time to produce the book. Selecting the author we wanted was relatively straightforward. We needed someone with an established reputation who understood UK SIGINT and who was less focused on the organisation of British SIGINT than on its effect. And practically this meant Professor John Ferris from the University of Calgary, who focused on this subject for more than 30 years. Assuming that we could get round the fact of his Canadian nationality, uh, he was the obvious choice for us. How though could we get him access to the material that he would need? Our solution was that Professor Ferris's researcher should be a UK national with a full uh, developed vetting who had worked in UK SIGINT and who understood how the GCHQ archives worked and who enjoyed the full confidence of both Professor Ferris and of GCHQ. Uh, we selected Jock Bruce, who had joined GCHQ from the army in 1984 and had worked in a range of posts in Cheltenham and elsewhere and who had also been very uh, closely involved with Peter Freeman who had been the GCHQ historian from 2001 to 2006. He'd used us both as his researchers inside GCHQ. Jock had left GCHQ in 2007 had studied for a master's writing a dissertation on the formation of GCNCS and had continued as a historian of pre-Second World War C and ever since. His role more or less worked as follows. Professor Ferris would describe a subject and a period about which he needed information. Jock would find the relative material in the archives presented to me. My job was to decide either alone or in consultation whether the material was or wasn't releasable. And if it was, it could be made available to Professor Ferris to work on in GCHQ, and a record would be kept so that the original material he drew on could be released after the publication of his book. We believe that transparency about what he could and couldn't see and the release subsequent to the book's publication of the records which underpinned it would satisfy at least some readers that, while not complete, uh, the access enjoyed by Professor Ferris was sufficiently representative for his book to be authoritative. The process wasn't smooth from the start. Uh, it took longer than we'd imagined for GCHQ and the University of Calgary to sign a contract. And it was only when Jock was in place that he could develop a pragmatic modus operandi, which we could agree with GCHQ's security authority to actually make this uh, circulation of material happen. It helped tremendously that the three of us got on well and uh, Annette, Stu and Tim, the three GCHQ employees most closely involved with the book, were also uh, part of a really close and happy team. We decided that the Cold War period should be illustrated by a series of self-contained vignettes showing GCHQ's contribution to a particular crisis. And as those of you who've seen uh, Professor Ferris's book will know, we chose Palestine in the period leading to the establishment of the State of Israel, Confrontasi in, uh, between Indonesia and uh, Malaya, 
uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Falklands conflict as being sufficiently representative. Finding crises from the post-Cold War period in respect of which sufficient information could be released was proved impossible. Uh, his idea was that he could write about the post-Cold War period using what was already available uh, in the public domain uh, as its source. And finally, we found a way, we had a, a colleague who was happy to work in his spare time on anonymizing a database of personnel information, which uh, listed pretty well for the people who joined GCHQ during the Cold War, their educational background and the post they'd occupied, their career uh, progression. The largest and expected problem we came up with was the sheer volume of relative material in GCHQ's archives. And this was the principal reason for the book appearing in 2020 rather than 2019. Some of the release discussions we had with overseas partner agencies took longer than we would have liked, but each partner had to carry out their release process in accordance with their own national policies. Uh, dealing with Confrontasi raised really interesting questions of ownership. GCHQ had a station in Singapore in the 1950s and 60s, which was administered by GCHQ, operationally controlled by D DSB, the Australian Signet Agency in Melbourne, and staffed by civilians and servicemen from both countries. So much of its reporting appeared in Australian reporting series, but some of it appeared in UK series. Uh, we decided it would be a joint decision. Uh, on how much will be released. It wasn't thought of really in terms of who had a veto, but rather how much material did we think could be released without either party thinking that its interests had been damaged. And this worked across all parties. There was less of an issue with other UK departments, but actually an interesting point of information uh, came out of it that... Uh, we perhaps hadn't really thought about as much before. That for most members of GCHQ during the Cold War, the relationship with Five Eyes partners was much closer than that with SIS and MI5. Uh, many colleagues had never visited the other UK agencies, but really knew their way well around Eastern Maryland. Uh, all has changed completely since then, but it provided some interesting background, I think, to what I would assert that the UCUSA arrangement, the agreements are visceral to GCHQ and not sentimental. They're part of the way the organization works. I think I can leave to others a view on the value of the published work, but <laughs> is it, can it be authoritative? Authorised histories will always attract criticism because of the selectivity of the material released. What are they hiding? Our GCHQ counter to that was by saying exactly what wasn't being released and by emphasising that this wasn't intended to be a complete his history, but one that set out to meet a particular set of aims. This should have been backed up by a release of information to coincide with the book's publication, but this was held up initially by COVID. At the National Archives in Kew, uh, HW92 stroke one to HW92 stroke 25 contain the material relating to Palestine, Confrontasi and the Falklands. Uh, it's disappointing to me that for whatever reason, uh, GCHQ didn't accompany the release of hard copy material by making digital copies, digitized copies of all the records available online. This is something I'd said would happen and I was committed to. And I don't know what the timescales are regarding the release of the rest of the material used to write the book itself. Professor Ferris faced up to the question of his independence as a historian in his introduction to the book. Any historian writing from privileged access to records faces questions about the independence of their account. When answering such criticisms, to some degree, they must rely on their reputation. In my case, the room for such criticism is diminished. 
Most of the material I used will be released to the National Archives after the book is published, though some files will be retained and others redacted to varying degrees. Anyone who wants to check my interpretation will have the chance to do so. GCHQ's internal histories offer a different account than mine, with more detail on the administrative issues. And he also faced up to a potential charge that he was effectively party pre. Anyone who opposes Sigint can easily criticise me. I regard Sigint as a normal and acceptable practice of state, so long as appropriate safeguards are maintained. There are obvious limits to what secret intelligence agencies can say about their work. An authorised history is written by respected historians who are attached to rather than part of the agencies about which they are writing are an obvious way of releasing and contextualising information about the agency's development across time and the factors which affected that development and contribute to a better understanding of the agencies and of the effect their intelligence has produced. There's a purist criticism that says that historians should not tackle a subject, knowing that their access is limited to what somebody else has assessed to be adequate for the specific task at hand. And there'll always be people who assume that any authorised history is designed to influence rather than to inform. But I believe such attitudes are self-defeating. And finally, I'm not aware apart from some isolated knee-jerk reactions in the press at the time of publication, that there has been any informed commentary arguing that there should be less openness and less transparency, that the agencies shouldn't release records or commission histories. Such an attitude wouldn't reflect the fact that the world has changed. MI5, SIS and GCHQ are public agencies which produce secret intelligence and authoritative top-level authorised histories of their development are good ways of ensuring that public understanding of them is underpinned by fact. That's all from me. Thank you very much, Tony. That was extremely interesting and, and actually addressed many of, the, many of the most pressing issues, some of the ones I was just hinting at at the beginning, and I'm sure other people will, will wish to raise. Um, what we can do now is, um, first of all, I. I noticed that one or two people uh, answer, answer, answered Chris's quiz question and got it right. Um, it was Venlo, one of the more humiliating episodes of British intelligence history in 1939, and somebody even got the cafe right, I think, Chris, was that correct? Uh, cafe Bacchus. Yep, good. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's one thing cleared up. Um, let's move on. And if people want to start uh, asking questions, there's not much written in the chat yet, but please do start writing or put your hand up. And uh, we'll try and try and uh, pick up uh, your your question. So please chip in. We've got one already from Kevin. Um, I'll, I'll read it out actually, if that's the easiest thing to do. <clears throat> what are the benefits of inviting a non-government historian to write the authorized history of having insiders to write histories? The US intelligence community has never done the former, but instead declassifies topic specific histories written by incumbent um, and former officers would current officers be less hesitant and less likely to ask why we are doing this well i don't know um who would who wishes to answer that question and it the benefits of both the agents but both the agencies we're talking about chose uh, an independent historian i imagine the objection to using internal historians is that they may be perceived as being less independent. Uh, any thoughts, please? Um, Tony, do you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I think just a quick point is, I think it would be very difficult for somebody who was a career member of GCHQ really to understand uh, the Whitehall context in which certainly GCHQ material was used, how, how it was circulated within Whitehall, the sort of 100 odd miles from Cheltenham to Whitehall sometimes feel as though there could be a 1,000 or 10,000 miles, uh, a very different world. I think we benefited tremendously from having somebody who wasn't locked into 
uh, GCHU uh, thinking model and could actually look more objectively at what we were and what we were doing. Thank you. I'm going to quick, quick, I'm looking at the hands going up. I saw Tom Maguire first, then David Omond, and then Philip Murphy in that order, please. Uh, thank you very much. I had two quick questions. Um, the first being um, that Tony mentioned the, the idea of an accompanying documentary release, archival release to, to accompany the, um, the history, and he mentioned some of the challenges with that. But obviously a decision was made, uh, or I don't know if it was even uh, entertained, and this is a question for, for Chris Baxter then, about such documentary archival release to go with the SIS history. And that leads into the broader question of, um, can we envisage any future, any near future when um, SIS uh, material that was at foundation of the history might be released to, ac to independent academic um, researchers? And I guess that feeds into the, the part two, which is, can you envisage under what circumstances and what kind of timeline could you envisage a post-1949 update to the history. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think both those questions will go straight to Chris uh, yeah. because they're, they're very opposite. Thank you. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't wish to fudge my answer, but I'm not, I'm not in a position to uh, understand what SIS's next move might be uh, with regard to uh, the release of records. Um, certainly the PUSD records, as you're aware, they weren't released at the time and they had a lot of SIS equity on them and then they were uh, subsequently re released uh, to the National Archives. Uh, but as for the release of records from the SIS archive, I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not in a position to, to know, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, well, one interesting thing though, coming back onto that was that uh, your question's quite interesting because at the time, I think there were lots, there was quite a, uh, there was a, an expectation that there would be a lot of questions like yours, but they never seemed to come to fruition when the, the book was launched at the press launch. That that, that was not, that was not a question that was uh, subsequently asked uh, a lot. And again, as for the post forty nine period, uh, again, even when we were working on the, the late the early Cold War, uh, the disclosure issues were becoming more complicated. Uh, the naming of people, the naming of agents, the naming of officers, people who are still alive. Um, uh, again, it was even then it was starting to get a bit trickier. Um, so I would suspect that most of those uh, would apply uh, right now to any possibility of a second volume being uh, commissioned. But again, I, I don't have a, a, a telescope or a lens into what uh, uh, senior thinking may or may not be uh, within SIS. Um, Thanks, just to add, just to, just to add to your point about PUSD, just to explain to anybody who's not familiar with that, the Permanent Under Secretary's Department in the Foreign Office liaises directly with the intelligence agencies, and many of its files have been released already in the series FO1093 mm -hmm. at, at the National Archives, and actually have not, I think, been quite as much used as they, as they could be, and they are they're. They've been released up to 1951 and the Foreign Office FCDO is now engaged in an exercise to start releasing material post-1951. Um, David Omond, you were next. Thanks very much. And Patrick and colleagues, congratulations on the first of this these series. Fascinating stuff. A quick comment and a question, if I may. The comment is not to underestimate the value of these volumes for newcomers to the secret agencies, and I'd include Chris Andrews' book as well, because when you do join these organizations, I discovered joining GCHQ back in Cold War days, it's actually very difficult to find out why the organization is the way it is. So it, it's part of the value of, of having these histories. Question is about the expression of historic of opinion by the historians in these volumes. There's a marked difference, certainly in my reading of the, uh, John Ferris's work and Keith Jeffrey's work. John is much readier to express an opinion based on his, his historical research than Keith, who is was much more cautious. And I just wonder, do you have a, a view on the extent to which the authorised historians really should venture their own 
historical judgments. How much did this matter? Were these decisions sensible or not sensible? Uh, and so on. Um, I don't have a view, but I was going to say, I, I wonder if one could compare that also with the history that, that we haven't, we're not discussing today, but is also extremely pertinent, and that's Chris Andrew's history of, of, the, um, of MI5. I would have thought that Chris Andrew veered in the, in the more of the opinion expressing side, as it were, than the, than the, than the more neutral side. I don't know whether... Um, go um, so I, yeah, of course. I'll, I'll have a go first. Um, I think it goes back to one of the earlier questions, really. I, I mean, Keith and I uh, have never been practitioners, have never been intelligence officers. Um, so in that regard, we can bring some objectivity uh, to looking at the facts uh, and trying to get uh, the most accurate story uh, forward possible. Um, was Keith maybe a little bit more reluctant to offer an opinion because perhaps he hadn't been a practitioner and therefore he just wanted to to lay out what he saw, uh, how he saw the story unfold. Uh, uh, and I'm always, sometimes I don't, this is a personal opinion, I don't like those historians who are very opinionated about generals making mistakes and if I'd have done that, I'd have done this better and well, you don't know because you weren't there in that situation. Um, so, and again, I think that may apply to being opinionated or offering your opinions on an intelligence officer and what he may or may not do in a certain uh, context or environment, um, that's that's a big shout, I think. Um, and just a final thing, just not related to David's point, just another observation, sorry, very quickly, is that uh, it's quite interesting, some of the SOE memoirs, uh, again, going back to the earlier question, uh, I think it's uh, Jack uh, 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 Beaver, uh, who says, you know, you can't write about SOE unless you were in SOE. Uh, and again, I might take issue with that because you could say, well, you can't write about the Crusades unless you were at the Crusades. So I, I think you have to be you have mm. to be fairly uh, sensible about sensible about why a historian can or cannot pronounce or, on yeah. uh, on certain issues. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I would say, and coming to, coming to Tony, perhaps I would say that you know, John Ferris also had no background at all uh, as a practitioner, uh, but merely as a historian. Although perhaps with greater uh, knowledge of the subject area that, that when he started than 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 Keith had. Um, Tony, do you, do you see that the difference that David identified between um, John's and Keith's approach? Yes, I mean it, it stands out. We we knew what we were getting. You know, John Ferris was a package, you know, a large Canadian package that we we valued his opinions. But he was able to talk to people. He didn't just talk to the team that was directly with him. Uh, anybody that he wanted to meet, and most people were happy to talk to him, could come along and chat to him and help test his ideas. Uh, you know, I think... I don't think there are any of the opinions that he expresses that uh, you you would sort of throw your hands up in horror and say that he he'd got it wrong. Uh, they are opinions, but they're opinions that are based on fact of understanding and testing the opinions against people inside who who knew their subjects. So I think in lots of ways it's it's something that it's not something that we could have stopped him from doing and have had a successful book from him. Yeah, you but, knew what you were getting. You knew, absolutely. you knew what you were getting with him. Um, uh, uh, James has a question in the chat, but Philip, you had your hand up uh, first, I think. So please, please speak. Yeah, um, David has sort of touched on, on this, which is, I, I suppose I, I initially I wanted to ask, what what is the value to members of the intelligence services of these public histories i mean they're quite they're quite chunky things quite quite you know they're, they're very interesting to academic historians but maybe practitioners uh, might not have the time to sort of sit down and and read read them um and and so uh, i'm sure that those those sort of classified materials which are used as sort of training resources but what is what is the value of uh, a publicly available history. And I suppose, is, is there a value in the kinds of debates that those histories um, spark amongst historians and journalists? And, and are intelligence officers, members of the intelligence services, 
um, uh, taking account of these, reading these, responding to them internally. Um, let's uh, start, start with Chris. I don't know, it's a rather difficult question. How is it being Hello, read within the, the organisation uh, or it's not? A good, it's a good question. And going back to the time of the publication, I, I think certainly one of the benefits uh, that I could see for staff uh, as an outsider, but looking at the staff within the organisation is that uh, it was a successful publication. Uh, there was great fanfare to it. And uh, I think it added to an esprit de corps, uh, certainly the staff morale. It was seen as something that, well, wow, this history is being published and we're part of something special and part of an organisation that dates back and is one of the oldest foreign intelligence organisations uh, in the world. Uh, and certainly on that level that, uh, they 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 felt that they were they were part of something special, and, and the book epitomised that uh, to some degree. Uh, certainly, lessons learned. Yeah, that you know, going forward, I understand. You know, there's always dangers of reinventing the wheel, and uh, and of course, uh, recruiting agents uh, and um, human uh, frailties or weaknesses, or looking at how to recruit an agent that doesn't change over time. So certainly, lessons can be drawn about how you recruit agents, whether it's in 1909 or whether it's in 2019. So uh, there certainly are lessons to uh, to be learned there. Um, Tony, do, how, how has it been received within GCHQ? I think I'd agree with much of what Chris said and maybe add that for what tends to be a very pragmatic organisation that has to, that lives in a world of very rapid technological change and has to respond to very rapid technological change, knowing, first of all, that there is a foundation on which everything is, is built is important, but knowing, too, that there is legitimate public interest in understanding how the organisation has developed, what it was, how it works, and things like that, I think reinforcing that idea that I mentioned that then GCQ isn't a secret intelligence agency. It's a it's a public agency that deals in secret intelligence. I think having having a book like John Ferris's was really quite a good way of pointing out to staff that they don't just exist inside a sort of hermetically sealed wire fence. That you know the work they do has broader consequences, and there is legitimate interest uh, in finding out more. So from that point of view, I think all three of the histories have, have sort of been very conscious shinings of light into what had been sort of dark spaces. Thanks. Um, James has a question in the chat, which is to do, it, the question is, has the authorised history of GCHQ increased positive perceptions of the organisation, or has, do you think it's posed further questions and conspiracies as to the legality and democratic remit of present operation, presently operations. Tony, I think you've, in a way you've, you've addressed that, but do you want to come back to it? Just briefly, I think, I think the book was part of a process of increased engagement that started as far back as, public engagement that started as far back as 2009. And I doubt that anybody has been swayed more than one or two degrees in either direction by the book itself. I think that it's that's part of a, just a general process. Thanks. Um, please ask and comment more if you if you wish. Um, anybody put the hand up? Roderick Bailey has has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Patrick. It's a question for for Chris, um, and maybe Tony also could perhaps comment on this. But Chris, you mentioned um, uh, you were talking about external archives. And uh, I think you mentioned that perhaps there might have been scope to enrich Keith's book with reference to, uh, with greater reference to um, foreign archives, perhaps, and certainly external archives. I was wondering whether you could speak a little bit more more about that. Um, you know, perhaps at a distance of several years, whether you think, um, and also perhaps in view of some of the reactions that the book has had, whether you think, um, uh, you know, what you might have learned perhaps from that, where. where um, where the book could have been um, strengthened, perhaps, but but also, of course, what what was possible, because as, as, as you the point that you made very well was that, of course, this is a book, um, you know, it's a one volume book. You can only do so much with it. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, Rod. Um, uh, and, and I think that there may have been scope uh, to do more now. Reflection, of course, uh, I'm. We've got to think of the context of the time as well. This was 2006, 2007, and, and of course, since since then, the the ability and the availability of online records has really uh, increased immensely, and they're, they're much easier to get at uh, and get to. Um, but yes, I, I think you know SIS, SIS is an organisation that operates overseas, so you won't be surprised to learn that a lot of foreign archives have uh, lots of material on what SIS officers were doing or uh, what the local police were thinking they were doing and keeping track of them. And uh, the Norwegian Resistance Museum is a good example. It's uh, with stories of SIS agents uh, and, is a, and is a great resource. Um, so. Yes, there's always scope to the route to do more. And I think as Keith said, you know, in the last comment I made there really that he took a decision to work on the SIS archive because this was a unique opportunity to do so. But really Keith, and he's always ever seen it as really a, a platform for others to sort of uh, go on and develop. Uh, and I think there's lots of room uh, to develop the stories that Keith touched on. And uh, and we, I always encourage people I talk to, to you know, to go, go, the answer wouldn't necessarily always lie in the SIS archive. You may find the answers in, uh, in archives all over the world uh, and here in the UK too. Yeah. I mean, and that raises the question of what other countries have done in, in respect of their own intelligence history. How many, other, how many countries have published anything comparable to what, what Britain has done? Norway is one example I know because of the history of the Norwegian intelligence service. And there's been an awful lot done on the Swedish uh, intelligence service as well but beyond that I, I simply don't know but it's an interesting point we're we're running out of time if we're going to stick to our our, our schedule so anybody else but there's plenty of time if you want to add more more comment or questions so anybody would like to do that please please do i'm not seeing all that many further comments and we are virtually at time so philip just asking your advice would you like to to wrap up this session now Yes, I mean, if there, if there are no, if there are really no more, more questions, um, I think it's been a fantastic uh, opening session, and and uh, thank you, Patrick, and and thanks to Tony and Chris for um, you know a, a really fascinating set of presentations. Yeah, thank you, and I'm noticing a lot of very very favourable comment in the chat as as people yeah. leaving. Um, I, I, I'm really grateful to both both Chris and Tony for being so open about yeah. what that, their entire activity actually and, and the, the constraints and also the responsibilities which they they, they felt they, they had and you know um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful example really of what official history can achieve at its best shall we say um, we'll stop there but thanks very much everybody and please join us again in three weeks time for our, our second session which as I say is devoted to SOE so that's another major major and very interesting topic we'll finish there thank you very much good night <laughs>